very welcome to John Polsky. A special welcome to Mr. Cross Secretary Nebois from the Polish Embassy and to Mr. James Kilcourse from the Department of Foreign Affairs who is to take up a post in Warsaw very shortly. And of course to, to all of you that have come tonight to attend the lecture. Um, George Bernard Shaw once said that a person shouldn't really be aware of their nationality, it should be just like their bones, or something that they carry around with you. But if nationality is broken, then that person can only think about getting their bone fixed. And many people say that there's not really many comparisons between there and Poland, that her experience is so different. But I think um, both her bones and nationality have been very well broken over the centuries. And with many attempts to heal them in the last century, again, an area where many comparisons can be made. Um, the subject of our talk tonight by Gabriel Doherty from UCC is Odon and the 1863 rebellion in Russia, in sorry, in Poland against Russia. And the important fact for Odon and was that not whether the rebellion was success or failure, but the fact that it was made at all because it was keeping the flame of nationality alive, which was of utmost importance to him in regard to Ireland. So we in the Irish Polish Society we see ourselves as a bridge between Ireland and Poland to make Irish people aware of Polish history and Polish people aware of Irish history. And sometimes we think that in the secular commemorations that Polish people in Ireland can feel left out that it's purely a local affair. But in fact there are still many many connections. This one tomorrow in Fast 11 is only just the start of the commemorations of 1916 and one in which we hope Polish people will become more involved. I'm very glad to welcome Gabriel Drury from Cork tonight. He has done much work in the area of relations between Ireland and Poland and Irish history and the revolutionary generation. He's author and editor of um, many books, too many I think that I can mention, there's um, various ones on 1916 and Porrick Pierce and also um, the latest one I think on Kan Sheehan of Dunaray, who was a, a famous writer of the period. The light especially to happen tonight on this eve of the commemoration of Gas Nevin where he's generously offered to give us a talk on uh, his knowledge of the Duncan Russell. Thank you, Gabriel. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pat, for that, for that introduction. Uh, in terms of the length of the talk, I would estimate between 40 minutes and an hour. Uh, if at any point anybody wishes to ask me a question, feel free to simply put your hand up uh, and ask me a question. Uh, I think I know what I'm talking about, albeit some people might disagree. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm trying to as well, convey I think, that knowledge. So please, I think, feel free to to interrupt uh, that, that your business. Okay, just in terms of an outline of what we'll be talking about, there are, there are four big headings, as it were, in terms of, of the talk. Uh, the first, which will be the briefest, is simply to explain the context within which this talk is taking place and which the event in Glasgow tomorrow is taking place, and also to relate this to some of the forthcoming centenaries within Poland. Because, of course, uh, over the next four or five years, in the same way as Ireland is facing into a number of very, very significant settings, so too is Poland. And I'll just sort of outline that very, very quickly. Secondly, I'm going to then go into who Odom and was. Uh, he's an individual who, in his lifetime, was exceptionally well known. In fact, I would make the claim that at the time of his death, he was the most famous living Irish. If one has a look at the extent of, for example, the newspaper coverage in America, in practically every single newspaper that I have come across, and I'm not talking about the nationals, I'm talking about the, the small town dailies in the Midwest, or in Seattle, or all over the country, the death of Odell Ramata made headline news because he was regarded as the absolute personification, the incarnation of the Irish struggle against Britain and the Irish struggle for self-government. Uh, because of the circumstances of his death and because <coughs> what happened afterwards, the 1916 Rising, the War of Independence, to a large extent that name recognition was lost because a new generation 
of patrons, so Tory peers, Connolly, Clark, Cullen, Tablet, etc., etc., uh, come to the fore, and to a certain extent, O'Donovan Russell's fame in his lifetime, as is so often the case, tends to be uh, eclipsed. Uh, it was never completely forgotten. Uh, if, if one has a look at the number of Irish people who have the name Rossa uh, as a Christian name, if nothing else, that is a pretty good indication that in, in terms of name recognition, it persisted. Uh, what we have tried to do over the last month or so in Cork, his native county, uh, is to engage in a commemorative program that will help frame <coughs> tomorrow's uh, official event, uh, which is, and I'll come back to this later on, the start of the state commemorative program through to 1916 and beyond. Uh, we'll then come to the, the commemoration itself, what, what we have tried to do in Cork, what are the principles upon which we have based the commemorative program, and we'll then have a look at the events. Now, given that the program finished yesterday, uh, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about the events because they're past, and they are themselves part of history rather than post comic events. Uh, but I will say, if anyone wants to ask a question about any of them, uh, there is one particular event uh, which I think those gathered here will be very interested in, which was the parade in Skibbereen this night last week, uh, which sought to recreate and restage the master, or different master, and others organised in the town in 1863 in support of the January uprising. Uh, and that leads then honestly nicely on to the discussion of O'Donnell Master's Polish dimension. Because in many ways he, 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 he constantly referred to the Polish analogy. Uh, he was somebody who, who sympathised with the cause of Poland, both because he saw that as a means of promoting Ireland's cause, and he saw clear comparisons between the two, but and this is a point I certainly would believe, that, that he sincerely believed in the principle of national self government For all, he saw in Ireland and Poland two very good case, case studies of that. Uh, I, I don't think his, his sympathy for Poland was simply tactical. Uh, I think it was principle. But this is an issue that we'll be coming back to later on in the talk. Okay, in terms of the, the context, we have these centenaries coming up. Um, the first is tomorrow's commemoration, uh, which is taking place in last heaven. Uh, at 35, I have an invitation to it, so I'm going to make sure that I know uh, what time to go and, and where to go. Uh, it's going to be a full state event. I'll be coming back to this, but the President will be there, the Taoiseach, members of government, the Oireachtas, members of the Judiciary, Diplomatic Corps, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, I was chatting to some of the civil servants involved over the last couple of days, and, and they're on HLs because they realise the significance of tomorrow's event. Also, of course, from a Polish perspective, tomorrow is the anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising. And we'll come back to a uh, piece that's in your hand over there, a stage play that was staged in Dublin in 1945 that looked at O'Donovan Russell's life. And the author, a very distinguished to the academic Roger McHugh, I think without any shadow of a doubt, the Warsaw Uprising influenced his treatment of O'Donovan Russell's take on the 1863 uprising. But again, that's something that we'll be coming back to. Of course, from an Irish perspective, we have uh, next year, we have Easter 2016, it falls in March next year, but of course April is the date in which the original events took place, so we have a whole series, a whole program in place uh, at a state level and at the lower level as, uh, in the localities in each particular county and uh, city area, plans are being put in place uh, to mark the centenary. In November 2018, we have the centenary of the re-establishment of an independent Poland and I'm aware in general terms that the Polish state will be very keen to mark that uh, and that perhaps maybe opportunities for the two sides to have a look at how what each side is doing in order to, to, to deliver their commemorations to the best effect. 2019 to 23, we had the centenaries of the Irish War Independence and Civil War, and, and most people really regard 2023 as basically the end of the decade of centenaries. It began in 2012 with the, the Third World Rule Crisis, uh, and, and really goes through to that 2023. But of course, we also have the centenary of a very significant event in Polish history, uh, with the, the centenary of the Polish-Soviet War, the miracle of Warsaw, 
the miracle of the fistula and so on and so forth. So these centenaries are coming thick and fast in both Ireland and Poland. Um, and again, I think that there is an opportunity uh, for both sides to see what they're doing. And certainly as a, as a professional historian, but also somebody who is actively engaged in this commemoration, I will be very interested to see what happens in Poland and how they approach their... Okay, to move on to the biography of Wojtyla Mbappe. These are the main themes that we'll be looking at. There are about seven or eight of these mark the successive phases of his life. So we'll just get going on the first, which is the circumstances of his birth. Uh, born in West Cork in 1831, I always say Ross Carberry Parish because there is an active contest as to precisely where he was born. Uh, there, there is some good natured disagreement as to exactly the location. So I played safe and don't defend anybody by simply saying Ross Carberry Parish and uh, nobody falls out with me. Uh, an important point to note is that this area of West Cork in 1831 was almost, not completely, but almost entirely Irish speaking. It was sort of a, a Gaelic speaking milieu. Old General Master was raised in that Gaelic speaking milieu. Uh, and it's, it was a, a theme, an issue that, for which he had great affection and reverence uh, throughout his life. And, and the destruction wrought upon that Gaelic culture by the famine, which I'll be in a second, was something which I think Monchon don't underestimate as a motive force in his political activities. The famine in West Cork was proverbially awful. Now, there is some dispute among scholars as to exactly which part of Ireland was worst affected by the famine. Uh, it is, frankly, a rather pointless debate because one can never measure exactly the number of people who died. So great were they. Of course, in Poland, uh, you have that, that problem also as to try to figure out exactly how many people died in any given area. What we do know is that it wrought utter devastation on the area. Very large numbers of people died very large numbers of people emigrated. Uh, and society was changed almost overnight and forever. Uh, the famine impacted directly on the Irish language. Sibirine ceases to be an Irish speaking area. And indeed, the, the, the West Coast area ceases to be primarily an Irish speaking area within a couple of decades. Imagine that in Poland. Imagine Poland becoming entirely Russian speaking or German speaking, they tried it, this is cold to know. Uh, imagine if they succeeded, not because of state policy, but because of an awful event such as the Irish Sun. It happened in Ireland, and of course, this is one of the great themes of Irish history, the long-term consequence of that transition from, as it were, the indigenous language to, to the language of what was, in effect, and I'll use the term rather, term rather quickly, the, the, the colonizing power. But also traditional religious practices, traditional sporting practice, social structures, etc. Of course, death and emigration hit the, the poorest, who were the most Gaelicized sections of society, the hardest. But Edward Russell was not from the absolute lowest stratum of society. Uh, he was from probably sort of a step or two above uh, the, the absolute poorest and most destitute. Uh, his family did employ one or two people to help out uh, on, on their farm, etc., etc. Uh, Edward Russell subsequently became uh, a business owner, a small shopkeeper. So he wasn't somebody who was on the absolute lowest end of the social strata. But the famine was no great respect of social status, certainly in a small area like Skibari. Uh, and he was both a victim and survivor of the famine. His father died during the famine, he, uh, as did a number of his friends. Probably one of the most haunting poems that we have in the English language of the effect of the famine was written by the Dunbar Nossa, and he was quite a distinguished poet. Um, it tells of the, st the story of the death of a family friend, uh, a, a mother called Jill and Andy, whose son had Down syndrome, uh, with whom and his son had played with Odunbar Nossa throughout his life. Uh, the son comes to Odunbar Nossa and says, my mother is now dead. Odunbar Nossa has to pick the body up, carry her uh, to the place of burial. There is no coffin, there are no coffins. They have to simply dig a pit. They lay her body in the ground. They cover her face <coughs> because they didn't want no one to go into her mouth, and then they have to simply leave her. And within a month, her son had died also. You cannot overestimate 
the impact that the trauma of the famine had on the Durban Rossa. It is the formative experience of his life. I mean, he is, as you can see there, he's in his teens, in his mid teens, probably the most impressionable point of any person's life. And just a point, another point there, that his mother and his sisters, his family, had to emigrate, as of course did large numbers of other people. Uh, and in terms of its impact upon him, he certainly subscribed to the, the John Mitchell victim that God sent the potential blight, but it was England that made the famine. Now, of course, modern scholarship disputes that and the whole series of exchanges as to exactly what caused the famine in any given area and so on and so forth. Uh, but Mitchell's view was of London and view, and it was shared by a very large section of Irish society for decades afterwards. And indeed, even within modern scholarship, there, are, there is impeccable scholarship that would suggest that the government behaves, as it were, with callous disregard for the, alarming, the alarm bells that were ringing left, right, and centre in Ireland in the years immediately before the government of the So, this is one story. Uh, one report, uh, albeit a very well known report, uh, of the situation <coughs> in Skibbery in West Cork, in his native area. The, the, the report from West Cork in the Illustrated London News at this time uh, had an extensive reach. This was bringing the story of West Cork to the heart of the English metropolis. And I'll you know, simply read it out. Uh, it, is, it, it, it makes for disturbing reading. I've now, with perfect confidence, say that neither pen nor pencil ever could portray the misery and horror at this moment to be witnessed in Skibbery. We first proceeded to Bridgetown, and there I saw the dying, the living, and the dead lying indiscriminately upon the same floor, without anything between them and the cold earth, save a few miserable rags upon them. To point to any particular house as proof of this would be a waste of time, as all were in the same state, and not a single house out of 500 could boast of being free from fear, death and fear. So <coughs> several could be pointed out with the dead lying close to the living for the space of three or four, even six days, without any effort being made to remove the bodies to a last resting. That report could have been repeated time of uh, uh, the mind uh, in any particular part of West Coast, and indeed it could be repeated uh, in many parts of Ireland generally. The, the classic images that we have of the Irish famine are all taken from Skibbery. They are all taken from the reports from the Illustrated London News. They are reporters who went to Skibbery. This is where O'Donnell and Rossa is, is living. And of course, as awful as these images are, they do not begin to compare with the reality. The reality is that you have decomposing bodies lying here, there, and everywhere, as we've just seen, uh, with, with the, the living who simply weren't able to move the dead, having to move amongst them. One doesn't, and of course, uh, from a Polish perspective, given sort of the awful events that happened, of course, during Poland in the Second World War, I think Poles, better than any other nation, can probably imagine what that would do to an individual at that formative stage in, in their life. This is a very famous Irish patriotic ballad, uh, Skibbery. Uh, I'm not going to, to go through the, the whole uh, of it, uh, but it, it, it signifies the sense of grievance. It signifies the sense of anger uh, that was felt within nationalist Ireland towards the British government that had, in, in their eyes, allowed this to happen. And indeed, in many nationalist eyes, wanted this to happen. Uh, just, just if you have a look at the, uh, the last verse, it yeah, signifies. The, the sense of the song as a whole. Our father's year, the day will come when vengeance loud will call, and we'll arrive with errant boys and rally one and all. I'll be the man to lead the ground beneath our flag of green, and loud and high we'll raise the cry. Revenge for Skibbereen. Yeah. The phrase revenge for Skibbereen was a very powerful rallying cry in, in, in Irish national history. The phrase revenge for Skibbereen as it was signified the nature of all the positions of government to become, as it were, a summary, a succinct statement of everything that was, that was wrong with Ireland, uh, and, and as it were, was a motor force behind uh, Irish separatist republicans. Okay, moving on to the next phase of his career. Uh, I mean, in terms of O'Donnell and Ross's claim to historical fame, it basically rests on two questions. 
First of all, that he is one of Ireland's best known Queen unions. And secondly, as a consequence of his Queen activities, he is one of Ireland's, and indeed one of the world's great political figures. So we'll begin with his Queen activities. Just to point out that the Fenian Brotherhood, which is founded in the United States, and the Irish Revolutionary, it was only later, Christmas, the Republican Brotherhood, was founded in Ireland on St. Patrick's Day, 1858. The Fenianism were committed to armed insurrection. Uh, they made intermittent efforts, particularly in the 1860s, when they were probably at the height of their influence uh, in 1866, 1867, 1871. Uh, they weren't particularly successful. But in the sense of striking a blow and maintaining, as it were, the tradition of resistance, that was, in psychological terms, <coughs> one of their, their key claims to historical sense. And of course, the IRB remained in some form of tenuous existence right the way through to 1916, and it is the IRB, rather more specifically the military council of the IRB, uh, that is the, the main vehicle through which the 1916 rising is organized. So there is this direct, direct, direct connection between Fenianism and 1916. It's interesting to note that even before the IRB was founded in Ireland, even before the Fenian movement became formally established, O'Donnell and Rossa was mixing it up, uh, was stirring disaffection in West Cork. He founded the Phoenix National and Literary Society in 1856. Now, despite its sort of rather high-sounding uh, and noble title, it was by everybody with common agreement, uh, a vehicle for sedition. It was designed to put into the public domain questions about Ireland's self-government, to debate traditional historic literature that would suggest that Ireland was a nation. It stayed just the right side of the law for most of its existence. Certainly once Odin Van Ross is recruited into the Fenian movement in 1858, it becomes effectively a front organisation for the Fenian movement in, in Tiberina and the surrounding areas drilling, dissemination of seditious ideas, literature, etc. With this respectable front, but behind this, as it were, the, the Fenian uh, influence is being felt. Odell Monrosa is imprisoned for these activities for a short period in 1858-59. He's not brought to trial, he's not convicted uh, in any meaningful way. He's released because the government decides to adopt a more accommodating policy. Uh, he then goes back to, to doing the things that are brought into public attention in the first instance, i.e. promoting the Fenian organisation. Uh, and it's in this context, in 1863, he organises the march in support of the January Uprising in Skibbereen, uh, which we'll be coming back to towards the end of the talk. Moving on now to his period as a political prisoner. Uh, he was a journalist, I and mean, I mentioned earlier on the, his, his skill as a poet. He was an accomplished worksman, uh, and for most of his life both in Ireland and when he went to America, he made his living such as it was, and it was a meager living for most of the time, as a journalist. So he writes for the Irish people, uh, this Republican journal, uh, through to 1865. That is then suppressed because the government says that this is a treasonable publication, and he, along with others, are uh, put on trial and convicted for treason fellow. Uh, he, he escapes the death sentence because it's treason felony rather than treason, but he is sentenced to penal servitude uh, for life. The, 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 the main figure within Fenianism, James Stevens, who recruited other than the Fenian movement, uh, escaped from Richmond Bridal in November 1865, shortly after his conviction. The original idea was to keep the Fenian prisoners in Ireland. <coughs> But it became very rapidly apparent that that simply wasn't going to be possible because a number of the warders were quite sympathetic to the prisoners. And in Richard and Stephen's case, there seems to be abundant evidence that the warders facilitated their escape. So just a question, you see Richmond Bible, uh, does that mean Richmond Barracks? No, 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 there was a prison, there were two, there was the Barracks, there was the police station, but also Richmond Bridewell. There, there was a separate Bridewell there. So Bridewells, at this period, were, were relatively small holding centres. You had the main conflict depot. It wasn't in the same area. It wasn't the same area. So, as a consequence, all the other prisoners, including Odell and Rossa, are moved from Ireland to English jails. Uh, he's moved to Portland and then subsequently spends time in many of the other main English convict depots. When I say the term consistently defined, that has to be one of the great understatements of all time. Uh, 
he was the most recalcitrant prisoner, arguably, in British prison history. He simply refused to do point blank what he was told. Now, one shouldn't, but one should remember that even the best behaved prisoner, even somebody who followed all the rules, did everything that they were supposed to do, would have experienced an appalling time if they were sentenced to penal servitude. They had to do incredibly intense hard labour. The regime was designed to break their spirit, and in the vast, vast majority of cases, they didn't. If, like Odunga Massa, you deliberately go out of your way to invite the full rigours of the, pu the, the punishment regime on your head, frankly speaking, it is a miracle that the man came out uh, alive. You have this progressive up, uh, increment of, of punishments. The first was the loss of marks, which meant that you were delayed going through the various different stages of your imprisonment. And, but then the, the, the heavy treatment started, the punishment cells, solitary confinement, uh, simply sleeping on the floor, bread and water diet, all the time uh, undertaking penal labour. In the, the relative short period of about, whatever that is, eight months, he managed to convict, uh, commit 19 prison offences. Now, how on earth you do that, given that he was committing in some cases almost three prison offences almost simultaneously? Uh, I think he, is, he holds the record for the, the most prison offences uh, committed. The thing that really caused the most public scandal was the period that he spent man called with his hands behind his back for 34 days continuously. Well, Jonathan Rossa alleged that he was forced to eat his food, like that, that he was forced to lie on the floor and eat his food like a dog. Uh, the authorities denied that, but when the Commission of Inquiry into these allegations, the Deputy Commission uh, completed its report, in effect it found that practically everything O'Donovan Rossa had said had happened to him had happened to him. And frankly, I'm inclined to agree with O'Donovan Rossa, given that everything else he said was true was proven. Uh, it seems rather unlikely that he would go out of his way to invent that specific detail. But the image of a prisoner being forced to eat his food like a dog was something which, which, not surprisingly, struck a very deep core uh, within Irish nationalism generally. Uh, just one little point to note there, that he was elected to the House of Commons while he was a uh, prisoner uh, to Tipperary in the by-election in 1869. I'm not quite sure whether, sort of how much he knew about this, uh, but the election was subsequently declared, declared null and void uh, by the Westminster Parliament, simply on the basis of the old of was uh, was a prisoner. Uh, but I mean, the election had taken place, everybody knew he was a prisoner, the government knew he was a prisoner when the election took place, and it certainly seemed to be rather odd that the government would intervene after the election and declare it null and void once the event had taken place. Okay, moving on. Yeah. <coughs> uh, He's released as part of a general amnesty in 1870 71. Isaac Butt, the, the very distinguished leader of the, the whole movement, uh, was, was very important in securing his and the other amnesty. Uh, the government decides he simply is too hot to handle. They cannot take the risk of him going back to Ireland and doing the things that he had been doing. Uh, so he was told that he had to leave uh, as a condition of his release. Uh, he had to be remain outside Ireland for I think a period of sort of 20 years. I can't remember exactly the period. I think it's 20 years. Uh, uh, he considered travelling to Australia, but instead travelled to the United States. And I mentioned this earlier on. In, in many respects, if one has a look at the treatment of Polish political prisoners uh, where they're banished to, to Siberia, the idea is that you simply put a massive distance between these political agitators and the areas where they can do most damage. Now, of course, New York was not Siberia. Arguably, Odubra Nasser could do even more damage in New York than he could do had he been allowed to go back to Ireland because he was beyond the reach uh, of the British authorities. So in that sense, uh, the, the, the tactic backfired. His name recognition at this point was, was huge. I mean, it, it, literally, when he gets off the boat, there are about four different groups who want to grab him and, and bring him to their reception. And he is Mr. Ireland, Mr. Ireland uh, at this point. Uh, the Republican Democratic Party is trying to get him to stand for them because he would have been a shoo-in in any constituency where there are Irish folks. 
And also that the Irish Tammany Hall organisation uh, also tried to, to get him involved and tried to control them, uh, get his name recognition uh, to back them up. He refuses. Uh, if nothing else, he was a, a pretty solitary figure. He was a, 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 the archetypal individualist and he simply did not like being controlled uh, by others. So his focus was very much on Irish America and promoting the cause of Ireland as best it could within Ireland, Irish America. It's important to note that, that had he opted for a political career at this point, I mean, he would have had his nest, nest feathered for the rest of his life. I mean, he would have been a made man. Uh, he would have had absolutely no problem from the perspective of, of wealth and so on and so forth. But he does not do that. I mean, he adopts for a very lonely path uh, indeed. He joins, he goes back to his senior activities, and to the extent to which he earned any sort of a living, it was as a journalist. The Dynamite campaign is without question the most controversial uh, period of his career. If his time as a political prisoner, was the point at which his stock was highest in Ireland and Irish America. His association with the Dynamite campaign is the point at which it's at its, its lowest. Uh, in the mid 1870s, many Irish Americans started advocating dynamite attacks in the United Kingdom. <coughs> they simply argued that you needed to attack the British states in London, in particular, at the heart of power, in order for it to, to make meaningful change to its policy in Ireland. Or Donovan Rosser was one of those who supported the policy. He didn't initiate it, uh, but he endorses it and rapidly becomes the its best known advocate. So this, this is uh, his rationale. We must take the offensive. Action gives life, action gives health. A present garage cause is received with a hiss and a sneer. This is telling against us. A few bold and logic heroes must spring up and show the world there is still power in feminism, not only to scare, but to hurt. He is almost immediately ostracised, not just within, as were, well, respectable Irish or Irish American circles, even within Fenianism. The policy is regarded as being at the absolute extreme uh, of the movement. Uh, so even such distinguished Fenians as James Stevens, the, the founder of the movement, John O'Leary and many others, simply do not want to know what other than us. They want to distance themselves completely. James Stevens. General Donovan Rosser really be so moonstruck as to dream that any revolutionary organisation could effectively prepare serious work while his skirmishes kept striking in England year after year. It is crooning for notoriety so ravenous and insatiable that to gratify it, he would expose his country to the ban of civilisation. Stephen's argument was that Ireland should wait for a war in which Britain was committed and then strike an open insurrection in, in Ireland. And of course, Poles will recognise many of the debates that took place within Polish nationalism in the 19th century from these type of exchanges. There was a similar spectrum within Polish nationalists, those advocating, as it were, direct action, those are, uh, arguing for sort of some form of physical force action, but not these type of attacks on civilian targets, and so on and so forth. But Dunbar Russell's response, uh, he said that people like Stevens and O'Leary uh, were waiting for some miracle by which they hoped to take the thing. But the, in effect, they were telling that they were trying to create a scenario which, in his mind, was practically inconceivable uh, as, a, as a justification for their refusal to do what could be done. Uh, and this is his response. England has, England has ever behaved mercilessly. She has burned and destroyed and never scrupled to eradicate anything that oppressed their interests in Ireland. If we are to go to war, I go to just fighting the devil with his own weapon. You must put on your hoofs and horns if you're going to fight with the devil. So, I mean, he was, he was a hardliner. He was the hardliner of all hardliners. I mean, his, his reputation as this incorrigible, fanatical enemy of Britain is made not just as a political prisoner, but also during this period in the Dynamite campaign. And this is significant when we have a look at the circumstances of this period. Uh, so the, the Dynamite campaign in 1881 through 1885 includes attacks on the House of Commons, Tower of London, Mansion House, underground stations. Uh, in total, there's about 100 people injured. Small numbers of deaths, most of them the people <coughs> themselves who were killed through their bombs exploding prematurely, etc. As a historian, I would say that the, the campaign was utterly counterproductive. Uh, it, it allowed the British government to give it the perfect excuse 
to justify repression in Ireland and the United Kingdom, precisely in Ireland at the time when the land war was at its most uh, intense, and also it, it sought to nip the home rule mobilisation, which was then gathering place, uh, and also justified the crisis against the Irish community uh, in Britain. And by the mid 1880s, Lord Jonathan Rasser, having a decade before being sort of courted by all and sundry, finds himself almost completely isolated. And it, it, there's an att attempted assassination attempt, uh, attempted assassination in New York in 1885. But, yes? Where does the Phoenix Park murders come into all this? The, the, the Invincibles were an organisation with whom other than Master had no direct connection. But when the, uh, the, that, there was a quote I was going to put up there, right, I omitted it. I mean, he endorses them. He said, this is necessary. This is what we need to do. And in fact, this is, this is characteristic of a, a, a trend of the Russia. Even if he has nothing whatsoever to do with a bombing or with something like the Phoenix uh, Park, he goes public and, and, and endorses them. He almost goes out of his way to associate himself with things because he has no need to do so. Uh, and as a consequence, he gets blamed for things for which he has, uh, in which he's not in, involved. So, I mean, he, he is not somebody who, uh, in his mind, was, uh, in his terminology, the milk and water. He, he advocated direct action. Uh, and, and if that included uh, attacks upon political figures, uh, he, he was prepared to carry on. But again, from things in, in Polish terms, Throughout the 19th century, there is that thread within Polish nationalism that, that advocates that type of approach. So, by the mid 1880s, he is, he is practically dead in the water, politically speaking. But then, the wheel turns again. By the middle of the, 19, the 1890s, for a variety of reasons, and nobody, I think, is quite satisfactorily explained precisely why. I think it has a lot to do with the, the Parnell split in the constitutional nationalist movement, which led to simple disgust uh, amongst many people with, with constitutional nationalism, and people started to turn once again back to, as it were, the more hardline uh, approach. By the middle of the 1890s, this style is, is basically on the up again. Uh, we returned to Ireland briefly in 1894, 1904, 1906, and it is given rock star celebrity status. Every single local politician in any town he goes to, he's he bending over backwards to try and meet him, to have their name associated with committees to, to greet him. Um, because he is seen as the, the absolute incarnation of the struggle against English rule, more than anybody else. In fact, at this time, one of his point just appoints his mother to Freeman of Cork City. Um, the last decade of his life was, was undermined by in health, and for much of that decade, he was. Uh, he was bedridden, and in the last few years of his life, mentally speaking, uh, he, uh, his mind started to wander. One, one shouldn't interest him, I mean, he was 84 when he died. This is somebody who was born in the 1830s, lived through the famine, lived through the rigours of a prison regime, lived through an assassination attempt. Uh, he did pretty well to last as long as he did, uh, by the circumstances of the time. In terms of the burial, which we'll be coming into a second, he actually, we, we have proof of this, that he said, I want to be buried in Roscarbury, the place where he was born. I want to be buried in the grave, uh, the graveyard where my parents lie, where my forebears lie. Uh, he dies on Staten Island in New York on the 29th of June, and the IRB decide, with his family support, to repatriate the body, not to be buried in Roscarbury, but in Glasnevin Cemetery, Dublin, as it were, Ireland's patriot. Location of What's the name of the, the cemetery in Poland, which is the, the Patriot Cemetery? I mean, that is, that is Ireland equivalent. Uh, and the funeral, the St. Genia, which uh, is marked tomorrow, is one of the great political funerals in world history. Not just in Irish history, in world history. It is monumental. The turnout, the political significance, and so on and so forth. Just to go through some uh, uh, of the points. Pretty much the entire leadership cadre of the 1916 Rising comes together for practically the first time for the, the funeral. 
the approval of that signatures, their name is on the document of the, the list of the organising committee, which will be coming back to. And the next time all seven signatures and seven names appear in documents is the foot of the, the 1916 proclamation. You also have at least three more of those executed in 1916 who were on that organising committee. And indeed a number of others who were executed were involved in the funeral, if not on the organising committee. So in terms of the leadership hazard of 1916, there is this direct connection. But it isn't just 1916. Many of those who survived 1916 and go on to play important roles in the War of Independence, Civil War, and indeed the first several decades of independence, are on that committee. And it is, it is a unique gathering of pretty well every major figure in, in Irish history over those several decades. And the, only, the only figure I can think of who isn't on that committee but played a very important role in that would be Michael Collins. But Collins was still in London uh, at this time. Well, I'll be listing the, showing you the, the committee in a second. But it's not just at the leadership level, it's also in terms of the rank and file. This is the last occasion upon which the Irish volunteers and the national volunteers parade together. The Redmond Eye volunteers and the Irish volunteers. They had split over the, the issue of Ireland's involvement in the war uh, back in 1914. They come together for this one last hurrah, as it were. Um, and then the, the National Volunteers wither on the vine after the 1916 rising. It's the first occasion upon which the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army collaborate. The next time would be the 1916 rising. You have, uh, I think, I, I can't remember the exact figure, but, uh, I think it's 5,000 members of the Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army parade in the cortege with weapons. Their rifles are displayed openly, they're all they're in uniform, uh, and it is the most overt challenge to British authority you could possibly imagine. The British don't dare to interfere. They have bitter recollections, of course, of the Hoth landings a year before, and the, sh the shootings on Dr. Walk, <coughs> in which a number of civilians uh, have been killed. So the, the government adopted a hands-up and arm-length approach to uh, the, the, the gathering. Many policemen are there, but they're not needed. And this, is, of course, is the really frightening thing from the government. Had the, the funeral been a disorganised rabble, it would have been one thing. The funeral goes with machine-like efficiency, considering that it was much bigger even than the highest, the highest predictions of, uh, of the organiser. So many people arrive in Dublin on the day that it, it, it is almost beyond the capability even of the very large committee to, to handle things. One small comic little uh, point is that the funeral is like three hours late leave, arriving in Glasgow because the, the size. The grave diggers want to clock off and go home uh, because <laughs> it's like when they want to get home to their dinner. Uh, and so if you see the photograph of uh, the, the scene in which Pierce is giving his great adoration, the, the grave diggers are in a very prominent place. Uh, and some of them are sort of have, have this type of air about them because as Pierce is delivering this great, great adoration, they're sort of looking at their watches and thinking, well, okay, get on with it, we want to get home. Uh, but we'll come back. But the, 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 that great adoration is universally recognised and attested to as one of the great, great adoration ever. It is certainly one of the greatest speeches in Irish history. It will be up there with rather eminent speech from the dock and so on and so forth and uh, we've heard a lot of this uh, over the last few weeks and I know there is one person present who is perfectly capable of reciting this by heart. Do you want to? Do. Stand up. Stand up. We, have, we have somebody here who can, who can do the whole thing. And they, 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 I, I didn't even know you were going to have fun. I didn't even know you were coming. So uh, I'll, I'll leave the <coughs> Wasn't there some sort of a march just beforehand? I was there at the stand of the kitchen. I have a complete speech. I'm a little bit sharp here and there. I, I do the best for what I have. <coughs> you make it your own. A card, now be a brawn or aim at Hanu Shasta working in a workshop. Up be a bike or in our green. The Ian of Grass, a cry, Anum, Usum, Arling, Shin, Dear Mother, Egon Van Rossa. 
agus a hug rain fadda do ar an seal sha. It has seemed right that before we leave this place where we have laid the mortal remains of our Donovan Rasa, that one among us should, in the name of all, speak the praise of that valiant man and try to formulate the thought and the hope that are in us as we stand by his graveside. That I, rather than someone else, that I, rather than one of those grey-haired men who are young with him and who shared in his labour and his suffering, should speak here, it is perhaps that I could be taken as representing a new generation that has been rebaptized in the Fenian faith and that has accepted the responsibility to carry out the Fenian program. I propose to you, therefore, that here, by the grave of this unrepentant Fenian, we renew our baptismal vows. That here, by the grave of this unconquered and unconquerable man, we ask of God, each one for himself, such unshakable purpose, such high and gallant courage, such unbreakable strength of soul as belonged to O'Donovan Rossa. We of the Irish volunteers and you others who are associated with us in today's task and duty are bound together and must stand together henceforth in brotherly union for the achievement of the freedom of Ireland. And we know only one definition of freedom. It is Tone's definition, it is Mitchell's definition, and it is Ross's definition. Let no man blaspheme the cause that the dead generations of Ireland served by giving it any other name and definition but their name and their definition. We stand at Ross's grave, not in sadness, but rather in a spirit of exaltation that it has been given to us thus to come to so close a communion with that brave and splendid game. Splendid and holy causes are served by men who are themselves splendid and holy. O'Donovan Rossa was splendid in the proud manner of him, splendid in the heroic grace of him, splendid in the Gaelic strength and clarity of him. This man, almost alone in his day, visioned Ireland as we today would surely have her, not free merely, but Gaelic as well. Not Gaelic merely, but free as well. In a closer spiritual communion with him now than ever before, or perhaps ever again, in communion of spirit with his comrades, living and dead, and in communion with our own dear comrades, who suffer today in English prisons. On their behalf, and on our own, we pledge to Ireland our love, to English rule in Ireland our hate. This is a place of peace, sacred to the dead, where men should speak with all charity and with all restraint. <coughs> but I hold it a Christian thing, as O'Donnell Rotha did, to hate evil, to hate oppression, and to hate untruth, and hating them, to strive to overthrow them. Our foes are strong and wise and wary. But strong and wise and wary as they are, they cannot undo the miracles of God, who ripens in the hearts of young men the seed sown by the men of a former generation, and the seed sown by the men of 65 and 67 are coming to their miraculous ripening today. Rulers and defenders of realms had need to be wary if they were guarded against such processes. Life springs from death, and from the graves of patriot men and women spring living nations. The defenders of this realm have worked well in the open and in secret. They think they have pacified Ireland. They think they have purchased half of us and intimidated the other half. They think they have foreseen everything. 
They think they have accounted for everything. But the fools, the fools, the fools, they have left us our Fenian dead. And while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace.